بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is so refreshing to join you again in this beautiful Sunday at the Islamic Institute of America after being absent for over one month. Here I am now joining you, my dear brothers and sisters in our community. Uh, I need to tell you that you were all in my dua and in my prayers as I was traveling to this uh, uh, part of the world as I and many other friends in the community embarked on a ziyara in Iraq and in Iran in which we visited the shrine of our beloved Imams alayhum salam Al-Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah alayh, Al-Imam al-Hussein, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhim as-salam, Al-Imamain al-Kadhimain, wa Al-Imamain al-Askariyain, and finally Al-Imam al-Ridha alayhi as-salam in Iran, and his sister Fatima alayhi as-salam. So, uh, I need to tell you that we really had a very good time with our friends there, and inshallah, inshallah, next year we go with you again, bi-idhnillah, and it is a trip that you may consider embarking on because it is very uh, enriching spiritually it's a very enriching uh, trip so i hope inshallah in the future we will have the chance to go with you uh, one more time sallu ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad abbas sbada rafa yimkin la hi bada rafa shwiya rafa ala fawq بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كانوا قليلا من الليل ما يهجعون وبالأسحار هم يستغفرون وفي أموالهم حق للسائل والمحروم Those are three qualities of the pious man as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them in the Quran. The first quality for the pious man is كانوا قليلا من الليل ما يهجعون They don't sleep the whole night. Rather they dedicate part of their night for supplication and worship and recitation of Qur'an. The second quality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions for the pious man, وَبِالْأَسْحَارِ هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ They wake up at the pre-dawn time to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for His forgiveness. That is what is in their mind. And the third quality وَفِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ حَقٌّ لِلسَّائِلِ وَالْمَحْرُومِ In their wealth, in their money, in their possession, a share, a specific share for the needy and for the deprived. So let's go through those three qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lists for His great servant and for the pious man. That this is how they should be. That the first quality is that they do not spend the whole night sleeping. Rather they dedicate some time for worship. They wake up in the middle of the night to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
What is nice about worshiping Allah in the middle of the night is that you're not going to show off whatsoever. Nobody is seeing you to show off. When I go to the masjid and there are people watching me, there is a possibility that the shaitan may play with my mind and he may tempt me to show off. Show your, the best of your sight, your personality. Show people how great you can worship God. How good voice you have when you recite Quran. This doesn't happen when I'm by myself in the middle of the night. Because nobody's watching other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the believer wakes up in the middle of the night and spend time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the most, the ultimate, the ultimate uh, time, intimate time that we can have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That at the time that everybody is asleep, everybody is busy with their deep sleep, I would take a little bit time of my schedule to be with my Lord, to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every night Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invites us to be with him. Allah tells Musa alayhi salam, Kathiba man za'ama annahu yuhibbuni, thumma la yastaykudhu al-layl wa yusalli. أَلَيْسَ كُلُّ حَبِيبٍ يُحِبُّ أَنْ يَخْلُوا مَعَ حَبِيبٍ Whoever tells you that he loves God, but he doesn't wake up in the middle of the night to spend a little time with Allah, he is a liar. Isn't it that lovers would love to spend time together? If I love Allah, I would wake up in the middle of the night when everybody is asleep and I spend time with Him. That's how I express my love to Him. But if I decide to go to sleep and not wake up at all, not for the midnight of prayer, not for the morning prayer, what kind of love that is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Am I really in love with Allah when I ignore Him? When He does not occupy anything in my life? When He is in the down list of my priorities? Everything is in the top of the top list of my priorities, only when it comes to Allah, I put him in the back burner, as they say. A true believer would take advantage of night. You don't have to spend the whole night worshiping Allah. Even if you wake up for half an hour and spend some time with your Lord, enjoying that intimate moment with Allah, having your own conversation, having your own talk, your own discourse with Him. Allah has given me all the chance to have some private time with Him, to talk to Him, to confide in Him. He's the only one who would not let you down. People always let you down, either because they can care less or they can't help, but Allah neither. He cares and he can help. Anytime you turn to him, he is there for you. A beautiful wealthy prince in Iran named Gohar Shad from the royal family. She was known to be religious. She was uh, approached by so many men, honorable men, wealthy men. They proposed to her for marriage. And she would reject them all because her intention was not seeking any wealth. She was already wealthy. She was looking for a religious, pious man to marry. A young man came and he proposed to her. After checking him out and finding out he's a decent man, she told him, I agree on marrying you only if you accept this condition. What is con what condition? If you wake up one full year and pray, perform the midnight prayer before I accept your proposal. If you pray one year, one full year, 
Before we marry, I, I'm willing to marry. Obviously, the young man was in love with her. He was so much in love with her that he agreed, he accepted the condition. See what love does sometimes? It makes you do wonders. I remember someone, a sister, who was overweight. And after a while, I saw her. She, she was in good shape. She was fit. And I told her, MashaAllah, you did a great job in losing weight. What was the secret? She says, Sayyid, it's love. Uh, someone proposed to me and he says, you have to lose weight. I lost weight. So love makes wonders. So because he was in love with her, he says, fine. I will wake up every night for one year and do the midnight prayer. After one year, she was waiting for him. The princess was waiting for him to come and, and propose. He didn't show up. She got worried. This man was dying to marry me last year. And I asked him to do the midnight prayer. He accepted. What happened? What happened now that after one year I'm waiting for him to come and to propose? He doesn't. She went after him. He told her, you know what, when you ask me to wake up every night and do the midnight prayer, I did it because of you. Because I was in love with you. But after a while, I changed course. I fell in love with God, not with you anymore. And therefore, I'm not interested in you. In the beginning, I did this prayer because I was in love with you. But after tasting the true taste of God's love, I forgot about you. I forgot all about you. And the love of Allah has penetrated my heart. Midnight prayer is a great prayer, my dear brothers and sisters. If you can wake up in the middle of the night where nobody is seeing you, nobody is watching you, Nobody knows what you're doing. You just go and do wudu and pray 11 rak'ah. And do shaf and water, water and you do istighfar for 40 mu'min believers. And you ask Allah three ta 300 times, Ilahi al-afu, al -af, pardon me. 300 times. You think Allah will not pardon you? When you say to Allah, Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh 70 times, you think Allah will not forgive you? Allah will see your sincerity. In the hadith says, anybody takes one shibir. Shibir is, I don't know how do we interpret it in English. Anybody can help me with that? This is shibir. This is called shibir in Arabic. Almost half a foot. So, if someone takes one shiver toward me, I will take one meter toward him. And if you take one step toward me, I will take one mile toward you. Allah is ready to embrace me and to embrace you. Remember in Ramadan, every night we recite that beautiful dua. If you do not understand the dua in Arabic, read the translation. And see what our Imam alayhi salam, Imam al-Mahdi is saying that beautiful dua. He is speaking to Allah. You approach me and I turn my face. You are showing kindness to me, and I'm showing rudeness toward you. You give me an opportunity after opportunity, and I waste them all. Yet that does not stop you from being kind to me and loving. When you wake up in the morning, my dear brothers and sisters, you go to the bathroom, you wash your face, you take a shower, you put your cloth on, before leaving your house, before going to work, just ask yourself one question. Who gave me this ability? The ability of mobility. 
the ability to move out of my bed, to move out of my house, to sit in my car, and to go to my work. Who gave you that? You know what stroke is? We have doctors here. They can explain what stroke is. What's a stroke? Stroke is nothing more than one small clot of blood that can stop in the, those very small, intricate veins in your brain and your history. Your history. Even if you live, you will be paralyzed for the rest of your life. Who is giving you that opportunity every day to wake up healthy and sound? Being able to breathe, being able to enjoy your health, to go to work, enjoy the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you drive your car, remember there are many other people, millions of people, who cannot drive the car you are driving. Remember when you walk on your feet, there are millions of people who are paralyzed, cannot walk on their feet. Yet Allah has given you this opportunity without you offering him any gratefulness, any gratitude. He does not expect you. He is not waiting for you. People go arrogant with God. Sometimes they deny his existence. Sometimes they deny his omnipresence. But yet he is always patient with them. He gives them. He provides them. He is so patient with us that some of us go reckless and I go so arrogant that I believe everything I have possessed or accumulated in my life, it is due to my personal genius. It's not. It's not, my dear brothers and sisters. It's all because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who gave me this brain that can think and function? Who gave me those muscles that can help me to conduct my daily basis other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember when you were an infant, so vulnerable, who put that love in the heart of your mother to take care of you? Who? When you were smelling so bad and everybody was disgusted, your mother was not disgusted with your smell. She changed you. Imagine if Allah had taken off that love that passion from your mother's heart, who would have changed you? You could not change yourself. Who would have changed you? I would be rotten. But it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who put that love in the heart of my mother. Who would wake up in the middle of the night and take care of me when I was crying. Unable to fix food for myself. Unable to do anything for myself. It was Allah who put that love in her heart. So she can take care of me. Al Imam Al Hussein mentions that in his dua. Wa'attafta, wa'attafta alayya qulub al ummahat al rawahim. It was you who made the heart of my mom so hot, so soft, so she can take care of me. Imagine if my mother was someone reckless, someone didn't care about me but cared about herself. Imagine if my mother was so selfish that she didn't care about anything other than herself. As there are many people in this life who are so careless and so selfish. What would have happened to me? Nobody would care for me. I get sick, nobody takes me to the doctor. I am in need of help, nobody, can, nobody would take care of me. What would have happened to me? It is all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking care of me right and left. When I am infant, when I am an adult, when I'm old, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there for me. So, they sleep a little bit, not the whole night. They wake up and they offer prayers. They recite Quran. There is nothing more beautiful than the a house that the voice of Quran is coming out of it in the middle of the night. Two people stay awake at night. Two people. 
One is those who spend some time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They wake up, they remember Allah. You know how much God loves that scene, the scene of his servant waking up in the middle of the night and reciting Quran, denying myself some sleep to recite Quran. A man, a man who was known to be a robber, famous robber, his name is Fudayl. His name, his name, mentioning his name would bring horror to the heart of people in Baghdad, some 1,000 years ago. He was a very notorious a criminal that not even the government was able to subdue him. He had his own gang in the middle of the night, every night in Baghdad, he breaks into people's house, he, rape, he rapes women, he steals their property, their jewelry, and he leaves. One night, when he was about to do his business, he was about to descend into someone's house from the roof. And you know homes are connected in the Middle East to each other, so you can move from one house to another house through the roof. The man was about to break into the house he had in mind. There was a beautiful lady who have targeted, whom he have targeted and decided to go to her house, rape her and rob her family. As he was getting ready to descend into that house, he hears a voice coming from that house in the middle of the night. And he listens attentively. What is this voice? What is this sound? And all of a sudden there was a man reciting Quran in the middle of the night. And Fudayl is listening to him attentively. What is he reading? He's reading Quran. He was reading this particular ayah. Isn't it about time for those believers to submit their heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to submit their will to Allah and to surrender to Him? And he keeps repeating this ayah. It is it about time for you to surrender to Allah and stop sinning? He kept listening to the ayah and he felt as, he have, as if he has heard it for the first time in his life. For they spent all his time gambling, drinking, raping, partying. This is the first time he had a chance to listen to Quran attentively. And the more he listens to the Quran, the more his, his heart sinks in. And then after a while, after a few minutes, upon listening to those verses, he says, Bala qad an, Bala qad an. Yes, it is about time. It is about time. He changed his mind. He went back. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and Allah forgave him. He became such a pious man. It took him one minute of reflection in the middle of the night by a man reciting Quran. Read Quran, my dear brothers and sisters. Let's read Quran. One page a day. Half a page a day. During the day or at night, read Quran. Keep yourself close to Quran. Al Imam Zain al Abidin says if the entire world population disappears all of a sudden, I will never feel lonely. I would never feel lonely. Why? Because I have the Quran with me. Once I have the Quran, I don't feel lonely. I keep myself busy reading Quran. My dear brothers and sisters, when you read Quran, do you know what does that mean when I read Quran? It means I'm listening directly to Allah's words. Allah is speaking to me. Quran is God's words, literally His words. So when I read the Quran, I imagine myself as if I am listening to Him. A pious man would avoid having Sahra with his friends and peers. 
they told him, don't you get bored one day in the month, come with us, have, you know, Sahra with us. He says, no, I'm not bored. What do you do at home every night? He says, I spend my time either speaking to my Lord or have him speak to me. Are you crazy? You speak to your Lord and have him speak to you? He says, yes. When I want to speak to him, I pray. I do my prayer. Remember when you stand up in your prayer and you recite Fatiha. <clears throat> what do you say in the Fatiha? Iyaka <laughs> na'bud. You I worship and from you I seek help. Who you are talking to? Have you asked yourself? You're talking to Allah. I'm talking to Allah. He says every time I miss talking to him, I engage in a prayer. Every time I, I want to hear his voice talking to me, I go to the Quran and I open the Quran and read the Quran. Because Allah is speaking to me. كانوا قليلا من الليل ما يهجعون وبالأسحار هم يستغفرون. They would always seek repentance to Allah at the pre-dawn. Now a question, my dear brothers and sisters: If someone seeks forgiveness to Allah, does it have to be at the pre-dawn? Can't I seek forgiveness in the morning or at noon? Does it have to be at a pre-dawn? Anytime you turn to Allah, His door is open for you. Anytime. But there are times in which your dua will be expedited. Cross street from us, there is a post office. When you go to the post office, you want to ship something to California, they will tell you, we offer you three services. One, if you just put 50 cent uh, stamp, it may take a week for your letter to get to California. And there is three day priority, it costs you five dollars. But if you want your letter to get there tomorrow, we can do that for you, but you have to pay additional fees, maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 dollars. That's how it works with God. But Allah doesn't ask you for any fees. He doesn't ask you to pay more money to answer your prayer. He tells you if you want your prayer to get to me faster, wake up in the middle of the night. I have a special times designated for accepting for priority mail. And I have a special spots you know, there are spots sometimes for Wi-Fi. You want to use the Wi-Fi. If it doesn't work here, you have to go to that spot. There are spots that Allah accept the prayer faster when you go to these places. One of them is where? Near the Kaaba. Another one is where? Under the dome of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Al-Imam Ali al-Hadi, our 10th Imam, got sick. And those who have been to Ziyarah, they know Imam Ali al-Hadi is buried in a city called, called what? Samarra. It is 400 kilometers off Karbala. So when Imam al-Hadi got sick, very bad, he asked his cousin Abu Hashim. He asked his cousin Abu Hashim al-Ja'fari, he says, please go to Karbala. Go to the shrine of my grandfather, Imam Hussein, and pray for me under the dome of my grandfather, Hussein, so Allah will offer me my healing. You know who's speaking? It's not Qazwini speaking. This is Imam al-Hadi. He is an Imam. He is an Imam whose dua cannot be rejected by Allah. He is a man that he will intercede for us if we want Allah to fulfill our prayers. He is sending his cousin to Karbala to pray for him under the dome of Hussein alayhi salam. Abu Hashim being puzzled with this request, he says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, you're an Imam yourself. You're an Imam, you're an infallible Imam. Why don't you pray for yourself directly to Allah? Listen to what the Imam says. And Imam al-Hadi answered, 
قال يا هذا يا أبا هاشم إن لله أماكن يحب أن يدعى بها وفي طليعتها بل سيدها تحت قبة الحسين عليه السلام He says Abu Hashim Don't forget, don't get confused I know I'm an imam I know if I ask Allah he will answer But Allah has designated a few spots on earth In which he loves He loves to be asked there One of them is under the dome of my grandfather Hussein alayhi salam it, is, it goes directly, it's a FedEx, it's a overnight, over our prayer, immediately accepted. So, Allah tells us that one of the characteristics of the pious man is they wake up in the middle of the night at a pre-dawn and they do istighfar. They ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Our Prophet says every night, every single night around dawn time or pre-dawn time, Allah sends an angel and he will make a public announcement. Public announcement. You don't hear it because you're asleep, because I'm asleep. But if you wake up and you listen carefully, not with your ears, rather through your heart, Remember one time I talked about sight and insight? People see things with their eyes, but there are things that cannot be seen with your sight, rather with your insight. When a man asked Imam Ali alayhi salam, قَالَ يَا أَمِيرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ هَلْ رَأَيْتَ رَبَّكَ Have you seen your Lord? Al Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen says, of course. وَهَلْ أَعْبُدُ رَبًّا لَا أَرَى Of course I see my Lord. The man who asked him the question got very confused. Have you seen Allah with your own eyes? He says, no, don't get me wrong. I don't see my Lord with my eyes. I don't see him with my sight. I see him with my insight. Who can deny God's existence after seeing this immaculate world, world? Every day, despite all this sophisticated traffic system we have, there are tens of thousands of traffic accidents around the world. Tens of thousands. Tens of thousands every day. Some of them are so horrible, just like the one we had Two weeks ago when a respected family was stolen, was embezzled from us by a drunken a driver. There are rulings and laws and a government and fines and tickets given, yet every day there are thousands of traffic accidents taking place, right? Now there are millions of stars and planets moving around the, the, the space. Have you ever heard two plants, planets crashing, colliding? Have you ever heard two stars colliding with each other? Never. Why? Because there is a God. Those who say this world came as a coincidence are either stupid or blind. How can you say this? This vast, great universe can run without a creator, without a driver, without a leader. You cannot run a city as small as Dirbun House without a mayor. Can you run the entire universe without a leader, without a creator? So, every night the hadith says, Allah sends an angel around pre-dawn time speaking on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is delivering a message from Allah. Ala hal min mustaghfirin fa'aghfiru lah. Ala hal min sa'ilin fa'ujibu. Ala hal min da'in fa'astajibu du'a. 
He says, isn't there anyone who is asking Allah so Allah would answer his prayer? See, people say, why when I pray, Allah doesn't answer my prayer. Because you're asking him at the wrong time. Go to the Wi-Fi spot. Wake up in the middle of the night around pre-dawn and ask him. He will answer. No, I choose to sleep at that time. And I choose to sleep when Allah is calling me for a prayer, for the morning prayer. Yet I'm so arrogant that when I wake up in the morning, I say, God, I'm asking you and you're not answering me. Allah will tell me, hell with you. I gave you so many good opportunities to ask me and you were negligent. You were lackless. You went and you slept. You didn't care about me. Now that you woke up in the morning, because you're so lazy and you're so selfish, you're coming to me to ask me to answer your prayer? Who do you think you are? If you really want me to answer, wake up in the middle of the night and ask me. Do it on my terms, not on your terms. No. I want Allah to answer my prayers on my term. I want to neglect him. I want to be negligent. I don't want to wake up in the middle of the night. I don't want to pray my morning prayer. Yet when I wake up in the, in the morning and I pray to him, I ask him something. I would say why he wouldn't answer. He wouldn't answer because I picked the wrong time. And the wrong intention. If I'm sincere and if I'm in love with him, trust me, he will never hesitate a minute to answer my prayer. If I'm sincere enough, he would not say. The problem is in us, my dear brothers and sisters. If you ask each one of us, what is your priority? Who do you care about the most? My wife, my kids, my neighbors, my friends, my peers, my boss, and that's it. Do I really care about my Lord? If I care about my Lord, when it's time for Salah, I do not delay my Salah. Some people delay their Salah one hour, two hours, three hours. Why do you delay? Oh, I'm at work. So what does that mean? It means my work is very important to me. It's not my God. Had God been my priority, I would have prayed on time, not delayed my prayer. I accommodate everybody, my work, my family, only when it comes to Allah, if I have time, if I have time, inshallah, I will pray. Many of us have time, one hour a day, to stand on the treadmill so they can lose some weight. Are we willing to wake up one hour a night to lose some sins? No. I'm willing to walk. And work out for one hour, two hours sometime, so I can lose weight. But if I want to lose sins, to burn some sins, Allah says there is a recipe. Wake up in the middle of the night and ask me for one hour, for half an hour. No, no, I want to sleep, yet I want God to answer my prayers. No, sorry, God doesn't work for me. He's not my employee. I am his employee. I'm a servant. It's not the other way around. If I want him to answer my prayer, I have to listen to him. I have to obey and operate according to his terms and rules, not my terms and rules. <clears throat> the third quality. They set aside a share, a specific share, for the needy and for the deprived. That's the third quality of the good believers. I alluded to that in my Friday sermon, my dear brothers and sisters, two days ago. But I would like to elaborate a little bit more. Before coming from back from Ziara, I had a trip to Africa to an island country called Madagascar. I'm sure many of you have heard that name through the name of that movie, I guess. There is a movie, right? I have not watched the movie, but I was told there is a movie. It's called, what is, what's the name of the? Madagascar. It's called Madagascar. So, is it cartoon? Yeah. Cartoon movie? So, <clears throat> uh, 
and I was told that in the movie they show uh, wildlife, zebras and lions, none of, none of that is true. There's no wildlife in, in, uh, in uh, Madagascar, as a, other than the lemur. So, it is one of the most beautiful countries, but it is one of the most poorest countries on earth. One of the most poorest countries. If you really want to get to appreciate God's bounties on you, you need to go to the Madagascar to see how privileged you are, how lucky you are, how spoiled we are. People who are human beings just like us. They have two eyes, they have one nose, two ears, they have a brain like us. They have ambitions and dreams, they have desires, but they don't have money whatsoever. Completely poor, poor, but yet happy and satisfied. They are smiling. They are going about their life with the biggest smile on their face. And I say to myself, look how negative some people are in the US, that they have almost everything Yet they are not satisfied. Yet they complain. Yet they complain why my job is not very good. My house is very small. My car is not so good. Come to Madagascar to find out that you are living literally like a king in the United States. Look at those people. If you are lucky in Madagascar, if you are truly lucky, you find a job with $100 a month salary, if you're lucky. And if you're not lucky, you don't get anything. When you pass by any dumpster, by any dumpster in Madagascar, you see tens of people, tens of people, young kids, young girls searching for food at the dumpster. And they have an expression widely used in Madagascar. They have an expression of the four friends, four companions. They say those four hang around together. Mice, cats, dogs, and the homeless and the poor. Because they are always together. They all feed off the dumpster. On the dumpster you see mice, you see dogs, cats, and people. The tragedy, the starvation made them friends, made them hang around together. Do you see this in this country? No, we don't see this. As our driver was driving in the highway, along the highway, 160 kilometers, along the highway, hundreds and probably thousands of young boys standing on both sides of the highway, stretching hand, begging for some cash. You can help one or two or three or five, but then what? You don't have the ability to give all of those people cash. Then you feel guilty. You truly feel guilty. You say to yourself, I wish I had enough cash to give all those kids. Because God is my witness every time I look at one of those girls who are 11 or 12, I imagine, I visualize my own daughter. Every time I see a boy, 13, 14, begging for cash, I visualize my own son. I say to myself, what if my son was here, standing on the street, begging for cash, because his father wasn't able to afford what I can afford to my son. What if that girl, beautiful girl, was my own daughter, asking for cash because her father wasn't able to secure her expenses, her school expenses. She had to go out in the street. Imagine if you have a daughter who is 13 and she's standing on Ford Road begging for cash. How do you feel? Will not you be devastated if you feel that my child is begging for cash and I'm unable to help him or help her? They do this out of desperation. So who did this to these people? Why those people are so poor? Is it God? Was it God who wanted them to be poor? No. It is the 
selfish humans. As I was in Madagascar, that was a week ago, I read in BBC a report, a report by one of the financial institutions, famous financial institutions called Oxfam. Oxfam says that it one, listen to this, 26 individuals in the world, 26 only, they possess as much wealth as half the world population. Do you know what does that mean? Half the world population is almost 4 billion people. Almost 4 billion. So 26 people on earth they possess as much wealth as 4 billion people. Is this justice? Is this 21st century? Or this is society? Or this is the 21st century jungle? Jungle. One, six, 26 people have so much money that they don't know what to do with their wealth. And yet you have people searching for food in the dumpster. And yet we talk about democracy. And we talk about the human rights. And we talk about constitutional rights. And we keep talking about those words and chewing them in our mouth like gum. What is a human right? Is there really human right? I mentioned a while ago, you all remember that gorilla champs in uh, Ohio two years ago. Harambi. Do you remember Harambi? Huh? Do you remember Marhum Harambi? <laughs> you remember when he died what happened? The U.S. was rocking. Wallahi I saw with my own eyes in CNN. That was the title for the news. There is a worldwide anger over the death of Harambi. <laughs> a monkey dies and there is a worldwide anger over his death and 14 million people in Yemen are dying right now. Nobody cares. This is the 21st century society. This is the 21st century America. We have to laugh at this America. We have to laugh at ourselves. How selfish we are. That everything American is number one. American people, American chumps, American monkeys, everything is number one. And to hell with the world. I don't care what happens in other parts of the world. All I know that my chump should not be dying in the zoo. And if my monkey dies, there will be a worldwide anger. This is the product of this civilization. We call it civilization. This is the byproduct of the civilization. That they care about the wealthy. If you're wealthy, we roll down the carpet for you. A friend of mine said, I came from an island he visited in the Indian Ocean. He says the, he stayed at a resort. He says, Every night at that resort, a room in that resort, do you know how much it cost? $16,000. $16,000. A man in Madagascar is trying to get $100 a month and he can't find it. And there are people who call themselves human beings willing to spend $16,000 per night in this resort so I can enjoy myself. <laughs> is this really human society? Trust me, not even animals treat each other like this. Not even animals. Not even beasts treat them each other th this way. It is only this a human being. The selfish a human being. Very selfish. Who wants to spend five billion dollars on building a wall so he can keep the poor behind the wall, they don't come and bother the wealthy. Go and spend those five billion dollars on the poor people, starving people. If you don't want to give it to Muslim people, fine, go give it to non-Muslims. Most people in Madagascar are non-Muslims. Only 5% are Muslims. Go give it to non-Muslim poor. Go give it to Christian poor. 
Don't give it to Muslims, but at least give it to some people. And instead of building a wall, go help those poor behind the wall. If we had helped the poor behind the wall, they would not have come to our country and bothered us. It is us who are so selfish. My dear brothers and sisters, I would like to remind you of two things. One is our fundraising dinner will be on March 8th, Friday, March 8th at 6 p.m. at Nadi Bin Tijbir. So I urge you all to purchase your tickets today. If you're a family, please buy a table for yourself and for your family members and your friends. And please show up there and show your support for your institution. Without you and without your support, we cannot continue our mission. I ask you respectfully and brotherly that you buy your ticket, bring your family members, bring your friends, bring your cousins, and show support for this institution. Also today, at 4 p.m., the Islamic Institute of America is honoring a great reformer, Martin Luther King, at 4 p.m., along with some non-Muslim friends. Martin Luther King was not Muslim, but his cause was Islamic. He worked for justice, and that is an Islamic value. So I think we should honor him by attending and being with us, inshallah, today. If you can, I would really appreciate. So when non-Muslims come here, they don't see themselves alone. Rather, they see some uh, members of our community joining them. And I would really appreciate that. It will be a wonderful show of unity if we attend the event today. Allahumma khfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat tabi allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat innaka mujibu al-da'awat innaka qadhi al-hajat innaka ala kulli shay'in qadir wa ila arwaah al-mu'minina wal mu'minat naqra surat al-mubarakat al-fatiha tasbiquha al-salatu ala muhammadin wa ala muhammad Allahumma